well, this is like the question game. <laughs>
So all these all these things that have happened in our lives, you know, you don't, you don't forget where you were at. I'm sure you were know if you were alive at the time, you know where you were at on um, 9/11. You know, uh, you remember your first kiss. Um, you remember when you first had a baby. If you're able to have a baby, or if you have one, this is the first time you made your baby. So these are all things that you really you you really really remember because they're ingrained in your in your emotional scheme and your mind. And it's not something that's abstract or fleeting or something you did on a multiple choice test that you'll forget the next day. So these are the, these are, these are the things that we really want to try to foster in our training and our learning. We don't always get there, but it's the gold standard, um, and it's related to our amygdala and our brain. If you're interested in, in, in how the brain sort of processes information, you know, we want to try to get there. Do we always get there in our research or our statistics or our quantitative, uh, you know, research course? No, we don't always get there. But regardless of whether you're from higher ed or K-12 or corporate training or or an informal uh, learning scenario, we're trying to, to move closer to. This is, this is our goal. We don't always get there, but we're certainly trying to get there. And VoiceThread, as a tool, I've used it, and faculty I work with have used it. I find it something that moves closer toward the emotional, affective learning that we're really trying to get to. More so than necessarily in a face-to-face -face traditional environment, and certainly in sort of your standard online asynchronous text-based LMS experience. True, a lot of learning management systems are coming out with ways to um, and code and create and share videos and things like that. The voice thread is something that can be implemented right now with an open source LMS like Google or a, a poker tool like Blackboard or Canvas. Um, and um, it's something that it really augments the learning experience in real LMS. So the first case that we're going to look at is the case that I was involved with. And then we'll be looking at Caroline, um, Caroline Vasquez's example uh, that looks at um, a Latin American perspective. Mine was based in the United States. Um, and prior to moving to Texas, when I was in Florida, I was working with a group called the Texas Learning Consortium. They used to call themselves the Texas Language Consortium, and they were, there are a lot of really great faculty in small liberal arts colleges and universities that were moving into more of a blended modality. Not necessarily online, but blended. So working with some of the folks, some of the great people like Ray Powell here, um, and Michael Napatino, um, and, and others, uh, I, I was the consultant that was brought in to kind of like help train and do, develop some professional development for faculty to, to really get them exposed to blended learning and modeling and practicing some of those things. Um, the, the irony about that is I was in Florida, not in Texas at the time, so I was facilitating this learning experience completely in the online modality. Completely in the online modality. So again, it was about blended learning. What we know about blended learning is it has the best learning outcomes in terms of all modalities. I think that you know it's clear that the reason that is is because we get the benefit of generating those relationships and those experience face to face. We generalize those online um, versus a fully online modality or, or, or face to face modality. Um, so it's kind of really connected to um, our modern our modern existence. So I'm not going to belabor what the, what the TLC was really about. Um, but I'll kind of briefly talk about it so you probably can't see this anyway. Um, it was uh, a professional development experience that I created that was um, mostly asynchronous, non-real time. Um, we also had some weekly um, Adobe Connect sessions where the faculty had the opportunity to drill me with questions. Um, most of my undergrad faculty and online courses throughout the years have really cared less about interacting with me in any kind of synchronous way. But graduate students have really had to do the opposite. They love those 30 minute weekly sessions drilling me about what do I need to do to do this assignment perfectly to get what I need to get out of this class. Um, the faculty were um, kind of a mix. Some, some of them interacted a lot in the Adobe Connect sections. Uh, Is that because they were older? Maybe not as used to the technology? I think uh, it was probably a mix. Uh, I think initially in the Adobe Connect sessions, uh, I think I had most of the faculty. It was a small group. But later on, um, it, was, it, was more, it was probably half of the group. I think that it goes to the idea that I like to call the security blanket notion of you know, I want to see that you're real and I can touch you, I can drill you with questions and know that you're a real personality, you have presence. Um, but then after that, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm relaxed, I feel safe, I can go on and do my learning and interact with me in a synchronous way. So I think that. On my own time. Right, exactly. Um, and that's kind of what I found. Um, I built the course. 
course in the experience and delivered it in Moodle. Um, and we used um, Shriner University's Adobe Connect uh, uh, for their weekly sessions um, as well. So um, initially, what's interesting is initially in when I built the professional development, I didn't incorporate VoiceThread. It was one of the many tools that I used in the technology module, was, which was one, one, one sort of maybe 25% of the course, which was on the learning technology related to the blended learning professional development, which is really the, the core of the course. My goal um, per the Texas Learning Consortium was to model and expose them to the best practices and research in blended learning. I felt that it was necessary to integrate a small technology module into the course because I felt that one can talk about all these theories and best practices and ideas, but until you can actually think of yourself or see yourself applying it or modeling or practicing it yourself, um, it's not going to really connect. So um, what was really interesting in this particular case is that um, the faculty were cordial and kind and, and, and interested, but until uh, we introduced VoiceThread and they got to play with it, it didn't really crystallize. They didn't really see a way of doing that, even though we were totally interacting in Google in the online uh, modality. And I found that really fascinating. What you'll see here in a moment after I'm done is Caroline had a similar experience where we were talking about you know, some of the folks you were working with in universities in, in Latin America and how you were having, you know, a challenging time sort of like talking about the online modality and then as soon as you, you sort of introduced and you, they got to play around with VoiceThread, it, they just had a difference. And that, that's the same exact thing that I, I experienced as well. And there's many tools like VoiceThread. Kaltura is another example that's being integrated that you can do very similar things. Um, but VoiceThread, for the free version, um, you can start using I'm going to kind of buzz through some of these slides. I really want to get to the get to Caroline here in a moment. Um, this really, some of these slides talk about how I wanted to move beyond sort of like abstract knowledge and have them demonstrate and practice inside of the, um, the, the course in, in Moodle. They actually got to demonstrate their effective facilitation skills and asynchronous discussions and things. Of course, when they use VoiceThread, they get to demonstrate that in VoiceThread as well. Um, inside the course, I had a friend who um, was in group at time, um, who was kind of acting as my instructional agent. So we had a virtual um, story or anchored instruction where he was a language instructor, which he is, uh, where he taught English and Quechua um, and Spanish, um, and he had a blog. And what I was doing with this element of the, of the instructional design was creating something that was um, not abstract, something that was um, real that um, folks and faculty in the program could actually see and apply those abstract ideas behind blended learning to a real um, story and scenario. So he, he used, um, it was, was semi-fictional, he used himself and his stories, some of his experiences and his teaching um, in, a, in a virtual blog throughout each of the modules of him teaching on catch -along. He also, by the way, introduced voice thread to this particular group, um, and that's when, when it really took off. Um, Another little aspect about the, the professional development is we gave out um, micro-credentials, we gave out a badge at the end of the, the completion, so we gave this out to Kate, um, who's at a university um, outside of Dallas. Um, uh, the first week we covered the fundamentals of blended learning. Um, I won't belabor that. The second week we covered blended learning and second, second language um, acquisition. Um, I won't belabor the learning objectives, we'll share the slides on the, on the meetup as well. The third week, uh, and I, I really went back and forth on should I include a module on technology? We could have had a whole you know, training or professional development on blended learning, but I felt it was so necessary because, again, I couldn't see them really buying into it or you know, going beyond just sort of, okay, I understand it, but not believing in it without showing them tools that could get them there. I'm really a proponent of authentic project based apply learning, and unless they could see tools and an avenue to get there, I didn't feel that they were actually going to, uh, you know, sort of change their minds or sort of open them up about the blended learning. Um, and then the fourth week and the final week was really on sort of like motivation and interactivity. It was sort of kind of a, a sort of culmination of blended learning, all of those different, you know, aspects and best practices and research and instructional design and content and cultivation. Um, with technology, and then how do you put it all together to really influence and facilitate learning in the course? So, I, 
will pause here for a second and see if there are any questions or clarifications. And I know I haven't said really what voice thread it is. I've done that on purpose because I want to be able to show it. Um, but uh, I know there's some, some questions about what it is, and you know, I don't think anyone's used it. So, so you use the badges for for uh, Validate the accomplishment of goals, or what? How did you use? So I use the badges, and I know badges are—it's kind of like this trendy thing to talk about, and it's kind of buzzy and things. And there's folks who are using it and using it, you know, going back to the Dwight Schrute example, because badging is interesting right now. And I know folks who are using it very effectively. I uh, school out of um, code, was code School in Orlando. Um, recently bought um, from Florisite for a lot of money. Uh, they they did they created this course um, uh, on how to code. Um, Ruby on Rails. They call it Rails for Zombies. And it was this non-credit. So they used uh -huh. so they used anchored instruction. They used the whole obsession with zombies and pop culture. They gave micro credentials or badges as you accomplish as you demonstrated your ability to code in you know, Ruby on Rails. So so um, that was motivational. I recently um, reviewed a manuscript uh, that was on uh, motivation and badging. So there's a lot of things that are going on right now. Is it is it motivating? Is it engaging? And I think the answer is it depends. It depends if you're motivated by that. Are you a gamer? Do you understand that language? That's what that's what I read in this particular piece. So it's but that, but that for credentializing, the, the, yeah, yeah. What this particular so they badge, like learning like credentials that you can later put in your in your resume and that can help it's you funny get you say a that. job or something. It's funny. Yeah. It's funny you say that because this is a badge that I created. In fact, my wife made the graphic. But it was based on the professional development that I delivered and created. What was interesting is when I gave it out, I used Credly. I used mean, lots of places to, to, to give it out. I give these uh, it's based on Mozilla backpacks and sure. But I used Credly. One of the really great faculty who taught French, who we'll look at one of our examples here in a second, she was already on Credly. She was really wanting, wanting the best. She got it. She displayed it immediately. So I think it depends on if you're, if you're motivated by that, if you have a place to display it, if you have a community or a network that cares about it. I think that's going to evolve. One interesting thing I think that is LinkedIn's acquisition of Linda. So um, that you know, I think you might see more of this micro credentialing kind of thing happening. Obviously, you know, you have sort of Linda. You've got that ability to to sort of cultivate learning, and you have all the criteria and all the data on LinkedIn. So it's kind of a perfect match. I think it's a really fun move. Um, so I think the answer is that it depends. It depends on the learner, the context, the population, the motivation level, the experience. Um, will these things take off? Kaplan Higher Ed has uh, a traditional college transcript, but they also have the sort of sister uh, transcript, which is a competency-based transcript. So, you know, obviously, you know, there's a lot going on in competency-based education as well, which is a different topic. Could be another um, presentation. Or so. okay. But um, the faculty really enjoyed it. Um, you know, this this comment, if you can't see it, you know. They really enjoyed how voice, you know, again, voice fed with the thing that I could see. You know, this was all sort of theory and abstract until I saw myself using this particular tool. And we'll kind of explore why that might have been the case. Um, again, it's, these were language faculty. So we're not talking about statistics or, or English lit or, or instructional design. They, you know, they felt that that sort of the ability for us to participate in a different language and see those emotional cues and reactions and body movement, they thought that was a necessity to model. So so I think that's part of why this particular group really um, latched on to a tool that was a very visual, effective, emotionally, you know, kind of engaging tool. That, you know, What's the difference though with the video versus voice thread? So voice thread is, voice thread is, is, is really a video, it's, it's a multi-video, so we'll get to that right, so what it is here in a second, but voice thread essentially allows you to have those video conversations like we would have in a Zoom or a Skype or a WebEx or a FaceTime, but allows you to do it in an asynchronous way and not just video and not just a laptop. And whatever you feel more comfortable. So if you feel more comfortable writing, you write. If you feel more comfortable talking, you talk. If you feel more comfortable showing your face and video, you do that. If you want to scribble, you scribble. So if you're not a strong writer, it's better it's a great tool. Yeah. I see now I hear voice there and I think it's sound only. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I, um, I didn't know that. But yeah, it's it's everything. I, you know what I like to call it? I like to call it the Swiss Army knife of a learning tool or an environment. Of oh, a dialogue. It's like a Swiss Army dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what that is. I mean I got it. Yeah. Yeah, it's 
So this is back to Kate's example. This is not the most beautifully produced um, in media. It's the dinner. She was, she was kind of going through in French. I have the example here, but for the sake of time, I won't show it. But she goes through and she introduces all of these elements of their dinner in French. Um, she gives them sort of, um, she, had, she wants them to kind of reply and to sort of model and immerse themselves in the conversation and to demonstrate, um, you know, uh, some of these things in, in French. I'll speak French, so I'm not going to be able to uh, Caroline, anybody else speak French? Who's a little bit like five years. Five years, yeah. Five years, yeah. Five years, and was, was it sort of an immersive kind of, uh, what was it sort of, ad, I, mean, I took Spanish, but it was the complete no, no, no. abstract. She's asking, she's asking basic questions, so where am I, who am I with, uh, where, what city are we going to, uh, uh, who are we going to have to spend the weekend with, and right. then how many hours did this travel last? So, so she's just asking basic comprehension questions from the conversation that she had earlier when she was in the car. In, in, in this voice thread example, she's going to have students respond and interact in that language and immerse themselves in that language. What's neat about this is that she's established her presence. She's established a real kind of like um, situation with a real family, with a real event, Easter, with food, real food. Um, so you are kind of like simulating that immersive kind of use of the language versus a textbook and me going through this and or even doing it in a classroom. So I think that uh, that was another aspect of why this particular tool resonated with, with this language faculty. Here they are at the dinner. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of an apex of emotional first example of um, you know, uh, a story in the teaching with story and narrative. Um, and we're going to move on to case two with Carol. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, uh, when I, when I, when Jim and I first started talking about voice thread, we kept on talking on and on about voice thread, and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, another tool, another tool. And I wasn't really um, paying a lot of attention to to what uh, what the tool was about, what the potential was about the tool. And, and he was very excited about the tool, and he kept on talking about it, but I really wasn't really paying too much attention. But, uh, but then we had, we had a challenge uh, in the work that I'm doing. Let me talk to you a little bit about our day jobs. In our day jobs, uh, we help to bring uh, universities who want to develop online programs, and we help to bring these programs online. So a university wants to create a bachelor's, in many universities for various reasons, for cost reasons, for accessibility reasons, for class, to be able to allow students that uh, traditionally cannot go and, and pursue higher education, suddenly online education becomes an option. And, and we are the people that help these programs become from the face-to-face -to, -face to the online. That's, that's James and I uh, work. With the design, we help with the course development, we help with the quality of those programs, we help with the delivery of those courses. We have forms, workshops, professional development, and we help them um, improve those programs on an ongoing basis. So, from in that perspective, my job is in Latin America. I work specifically with universities in. in North and South America uh, bring those programs online. Now, what is the challenge? The challenge is that the, the company we work with has great, validated programs but that are very US centric. And by being US centric means that there are assumptions that we make of what works, but that doesn't really work everywhere. And, and there are elements of historicity on how the U.S. even got to this uh, point where technology comes second nature in universities that is not true or really applicable in other contexts. So that's one area. Another area is the disparities in access to reliable internet infrastructure. That 
that's that's a fact. This is the same city. This is Medellin, Colombia. In the same city, we have this and we have this. That is a reality in all of Latin America. The disparities are huge, even within the same city. So, having that said, that doesn't mean you would say, but people in this slum do not go to college. That's not true either. People who go to college, everybody has a cell phone, everybody. To my surprise, that I have an older version of the iPhone, everybody has the latest version of the iPhone. That is the, so, so we need to a little bit break back on the stereotypes that it's only us that access a specific levels of technology. But it is a reality. And then the, the truth is that both in the US, so let me clarify that it is not just a reality of Latin America, this is a reality overall in, in higher education. It's a banking nature of education. Meaning, uh, by banking nature, it assumes that students are empty vessels and we just pour a bunch of knowledge on them. They have no experience, they have no expertise, they, they are, we are the source of knowledge. That is condescending, that is inaccurate, and that is an impairment to quality education. Because if you assume that on the other end are just a bunch of ignorant people, then you lose a lot of opportunities to really develop rich experiences. Uh, uh, then let's talk a little bit about culture. And I'm sorry that this slide is not the best. And, and I'm going to make a stop about culture because when we talk about assumptions, uh, we all come with assumptions to education, to life, to, to everything. So when we talk about culture, there's certain things about culture. We see art, we see stories, we see food. We think that we dress up and suddenly I am so Mexican. I just talk like that. <laughs> and I've been called Mexican many times and to my pride I say thank you very much. I, I do not deserve that praise, but thank you. But then there are other more underlying things related to culture that are deeper and that we need to consider whenever we are not only determining the truth, and I'm going to go again to the, to the way Fred, but this is where both Fred can really leverage. Uh, there are things not only language, but uh, assumptions and even body gestures and, and ways of saying things and ways of interpreting things and ways of thinking and saying and tools that we use and words that we use and, and a lot more. So, so, so when we see culture, we're only the surface. All the more passive elements are those that tools like both Fred, I, I came to know this, uh, and thanks to, to Jeff's insistence that that would really uh, uh, have a lot of potential for the for the faculty that I work with. In my case for the specific department. So the solution was not an either or, it's actually a combination. So we combine the best comparable, comparable approaches. And, and uh, elements like both bread and elements like the community of inquiry have a, a, an amazing things to contribute. And if you also combine it with other approaches that consider culture, that consider otherness, then you can really bring them together and empower an educational model and an educational tool to levels that otherwise could be seen as only another technology. So the one element was promoting cultural responsive pedagogy. And I put it upside down because when you embrace cultural responsive pedagogy, you need to look things from a different perspective. You have to step away from the assumptions that you have adopted as, as right, as, as the, the, the best, and question yourself and be 
and be disrupted with your own thinking. Unless you dare to be disrupted and question your own thinking, then you will continue to stand in your white horse and miss the opportunity. Now, one of the elements that a uh, voice thread promotes and that is uh, aligned with a more culturally embracing pedagogy is the element of dialogue. One of the things that my universities and the faculty that I served were hungry or thirsty for was talking to each other. Uh, different cultures are not deserved, different cultures, their, uh, their boundaries of space between the people are closer or farther away. In, in terms of the Latin culture, personal space can easily be non-existent and people are very comfortable. Uh, so dialogue, the fact that with voice you can literally talk, and you eliminate, like you were saying, Amanda, the, 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 the limitations of the written language. Mm -hmm. So what if you, for whatever reasons, you're, we, we are their voice. We, we like to talk. We come on, we're academic. I mean, we can talk. I talk in our sleep. My husband has called me. <laughs> <laughs> My husband has told me, I talk on my sleep theories. He's, I'm sure he's scary. I, I cannot think he's sexy. <laughs> and, and, and also, I can write very well. Can you see? No, no. no, 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 no. I can no. but, but, but not everybody. But with people that have the conventional programs, especially in the way that we have trained the world, the, the universities are okay, we need to have a discussion forum. That's the that's standard in any online course. And everything is written. And then the professor doesn't do, give feedback or doesn't contribute back. So as you go in the progress in a course, the discussion uh, forums die. Because the student has to write, because the student exposes themselves in their limitations, in their writing skills. With, with the word thread, the student can actually just wrap his cell phone. They don't need any sophisticated tool. Just a flat uh, cell phone that everybody has now a camera and a recording mechanism and record themselves. We're a YouTube society. Exactly. And, and, that, and, and that democratization of, of, of your expression through video is one of the elements that they potentialize. Now, the other element that I brought into, and that's not necessarily an element within a, a boyfriend, but that I use, is that beyond dialogue, we were using boyfriend to reflect and act upon our reality to change. So uh, this is one of my role models. And he said that power came from risking ourselves in creation. And praxis, which is one of the concepts that he helped promote or that he came up with, he talked about dialogue that helped us reflect upon our realities and that helped us transform those realities. So what I did in the context of this training uh, opportunity with this faculty was that we took our reality of our, so what, are the, what was part of our reality? We had high you know, very, very high attrition rate, meaning we were losing many students. A, not a lot of, a, you know, the, the performance of their students was low. The interaction of the faculty wasn't the best. And we started analyzing without judgment that reality. 
what, how are we doing? So I use, based on also prayer, and also you can also talk, uh, um, you know, just uh, uh, beginning with, with, with big global questions. How are we doing? What is working? What is not working? How can we make it better? And then another element that we did, and, we, and that's why we use portrait over and over. So we had a reiterative process. We began at first, and I'm going to show you how they began maybe actually writing. They would actually not record themselves. They were actually writing text, just as they had been programmed all their time. And we started, what were their experience? They were, then we were looking for current. Do, do we see things that are happening over and over with different people? We have professors of engineering, we have professors of, of graphic design, we have professors of mathematics, of uh, language arts. Then we added new theory and information. And then we would strategize every time we run a useful thread in my model, we tie it up to an action plan where people decided one thing they wanted to change. And then they talked about that one thing that they wanted to change and why, and then others would feed into telling them, oh, why don't you do this? Oh, why did you actually did that? But in this conversation, and this, and, 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 and let me contextualize you. And these, I don't, these were faculty. Yes, these are faculty, uh, and I'm talking specifically of the case in Colombia. This is a working class university, so these are primarily adjunct faculty. So that means that they're working at least another two places. So these are people that have. 10 hours here, 10 hours here, 10 hours here, and even combining the three, they barely make ends meet. And they, uh, they are, so we had, and let me, let me go there. And then another thing was problem posing. So I work with them instead of, you know, the, the, the conventional thinking says, teach problem solving. No. I'm not going to tell them how so, how would I would solve the problems? Because I am not in the reality. I can put the problem, make them think critically, help them gain a new perspective, and help each other help solve their problems. So I help them post things that they have never considered a problem. They have never questioned. I help them question. So it was not a problem solving approach, it was more of a problem posing approach with open ended possibilities. So essentially, it's like a, a brainstorming meeting asynchronously where you can just throw anything on the wall and see what sticks. Well, we were strategic on the on the things that we wanted to address. Right. Because we wanted to address specifically the issues that help with them improving their teaching reality, improving their course, and helping the students succeed. So we were specific on these things. So, so for example, the faculty development model, and this is one of my colleagues, eh, Paola, we had synchronous sessions. And this happened in Peru and Colombia. These are some of the people, you see them there. But some of them were also online. The training model was hybrid. It included webinars and a Canvas course. It was synchronic and asynchronous dialogues. So we had dialogues face to face when we were addressing specific topics. We focus on improving their teaching realities. And by teaching realities, obviously, I include, because remember, we were moving from a teacher-centered approach into a more student-centric approach. But if you start talking a lot about students when you are standing in a student-centric approach, people will stop 
hasten. So by 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 one of my goals in improving teaching reality is improving the results that you have with your students. But I always come from the perspective of you. You're gonna be a better teacher. Your students are gonna end up being better because. When you are managing educational change and you're using tools like Outbreak to manage that change, you need to provide, you need to do two things simultaneously. You need to give them what they want and also give them what they need. You cannot, if you only focus on what they need, it becomes prescriptive and it becomes like I was saying before, condescending because I, I know what you need. You go in cycles. And then some things that you actually think that they need end up being end up being different. You end up realizing that you weren't by no by no part of any the teacher at all. You were also a learner. But but you know there are some things that you can assess that as you're going to a more student centric approach they will need, but unless you provide simultaneously something they feel they want and they need, you will not connect with them. So you're feeling to that affective. Yes. And then yeah, 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 that you're, that you're, you're putting these faculty in a role of students, you're having them feel that, and you're modeling it, and then they're doing it. Yes. You center around topic of interest to them. It was two weeks, six topics, and, and, I, and I have a big variability on, on assistance. So my face-to-face -face were very, very uh, productive. My online elements vary. So I had actually eight people complete every assignment. And I had 18 people attend some sessions, some activities, some, but, but it varies. So I'm still tweaking what, what I need to do to also gain persistence in them. Because this is a, it's an element of persistence. I'm missing something to allow them to really feel like they need this. This is Paola. And you see how in Paola, Paola recorded her session, you see all the, and you see how this is me, Caroline Vasquez. I came back, came back, came back and again. Every time students participated, I would get an email. Somebody participated. If you sign in for the emails, you get an email and then you can go back and, and, and comment. Look at their comments. So initially, they actually had a lot of written stuff. They were writing just as in other uh, discussions. But as the program progressed, as the activities progressed, and as we brought it again and again, it was interesting. The first one we did, they kept asking questions about the tool, not about the assignment. So we had given them an assignment on communication, and they kept on saying, oh, and I really like going thread. <laughs> they, they, they totally missed the assignment. The assignment was, well, how are you promoting communication in your classroom? They never answered that. We actually had to go back and tell them, guys, the assignment is talking about how you communicating in your classroom. Oh, oh, and they posted it in. So you know that affective. Yes, because they related to it. Uh-huh. And then as they came back, they came back with videos. They came back with audio. With other mediums that otherwise they had not done. Now, uh, one limitation in the in the international uh, forum, especially for you that you may be interested, is that going uh, through one of the elements that you can give feedback is that you put a phone and and voice uh, thread calls you to get your feedback. That feature is not present for international because voice thread will not call international numbers. But besides that, 
the video, the audio, the written, the scribble, they're all there. And, and obviously, you see, John, John is a, is, is, is a techie guy. He will put his picture. He is a techie guy. The other ones, no. But this man, on Antique Lisa now, he, at first, he was really nervous. He wrote to me many texts in the Canvas course. Oh my God, I'm not sure I can do technology like that, blah, 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 blah. And then, one day, he posted his video. So he broke that And that was, uh, that was very interesting, because then he was very, he kept on asking me if I was an impression certificate. Because he wanted a certificate. That's why I was asking the question about badges. And I know that people are hesitant to post video that's not productionally perfect. Well, and that's also a little bit cultural because at the university, all of the videos are professionally done, yeah. and suddenly the guy is in his home office uh, recording something. He may feel that it's not the part with other videos. But once they saw this and saw the people, and we warned, and, and so we, we warned the path toward this. We didn't jump into voice thread immediately. We actually began with a fun, a, a welcoming uh, discussion board where people introduced themselves. They had to say a credible lie about themselves. So people were all laughing because they had to say a truth and a lie, a truth and a lie about them. And they were both so credible that nobody could figure it out, and everybody was cracking up. So we warned the path to the tool. We did not jump immediately to the tool. I'm sure that the next time I bring it up, that is going to come second nature. But I would suggest strategies, especially if you are bringing it to people that have traditionally not been using the technology like that that you do uh, what they know in an innovative way before you introduce this. But this is an actual way that helps, at least with the, Latina, the, with the Latino culture, to feel a thirst that they have for seeing each other, for talking to one another, for, for you know, listening and seeing and seeing the inflections of the face and seeing the, the the concerns that they have about it. You know, all of these things cannot be seen on paper, but they can be seen on the video. They can be heard on a voice, and that helps, uh, you know, to merge uh, culturally uh, some some more facet things. Any questions? Comment. I, I think that, you know, thinking about the cultural perspective of, of this, um, years ago I, I worked with a group in the Middle East, um, and it was a um, professional development experience um, done totally online in the online modality, but years before VoiceCode was available or things like VoiceCode, now you do it with Kaltor and other tools, practice, um, but uh, it, it really failed. And, you know, it really failed because we didn't get that that sort of uh, tipping point of interaction that you got with this. Um, and I don't know why. I mean, maybe it was because, who knows, it could be a multitude of reasons. But, but what I like about your example is that, like my example, you you sort of, you were in the online modality. Everyone was interacting in that way. And at the end, you introduced this other way of communicating. Um, and you saw sort of a take off like wildfire just like I did, you know, in different ways. So I think that is interesting. You know, looking at video, um, being afraid and making things are perfect, you know, um, it's, it, it's really just another way of communicating. Um, it's another way of teaching. Um, and it's, it's, it is effective. It is an emotional, emotional. We see it with social media tools, we, you know, and now as sort of a, a threaded conversation, um, you know, it's really breathing life into something that I think has been dead for a while, which has been the learning management system. You know, learning management systems, 
Yes, Canvas and Blackboard and, and others, now with Canvas Peltor and with Moodle and with D2L, you can start to build in those opportunities for that more emotionally effective interaction. But, you know, the LMS has been stagnant for quite a long time. And I, and I was very strategic. So I knew the potential, or I could evaluate, assess the potential barriers for them using and or embracing these. So I was strategic, however, and I actually didn't bring it up till the end. I brought it in the second session. So the first session was a very innovative a discussion board. Fun, lively people had a blast. They were cracking up. I had I had one of our co-workers, which is a young 25-year-old professional who is bubbly and. Right. Yes, and she's bubbly and she is just, you know, cannot stay seated two seconds. And, and, and she was there managing that one. And I wanted that. I didn't want the, the 40 something year old. I wanted the bubbly girl that is just bursting with energy and happiness to manage that. And then I said, okay. Look at this, and and they stumbled it, and stumbling was absolutely perfect. Nobody, nobody cared. Nobody said anything. It was just we are here to stumble into perfection, and so and that's the process of learning. It's a process of learning that we expect, and I wanted to model the same things. I wanted them to do with your students. So I wanted them to be uh, gracious in like, oh, oh, I didn't do it right. Okay, let's do it again. And, and who cares? I mean, that's what education is about. If education wants to get it right the first time, which is the conventional, you know, more archaic thinking that you need to be right from the first time, uh, who cares if you're right the first time, the second time, or the third time? Eventually you'll get it. And if you're not, maybe you find it. So, so, so that was the, the modeling that, that, that I wanted, and in that sense I was strategic, and I brought it again, twice in that experience. So I wanted one, and then by the second time, they were natural. Okay. okay. All right, uh, well, questions that everybody, everybody can see. Thank you. Thank you. Good question to everybody. My sir. Um, free. Premium. Let, let, let's do, let's do uh, Spitfire like. Uh, Premium. So, so, so just like everything interesting, um, it's free. Um, and, then, it. and then if you want to use some. So um, all the versions of Mark Price that I've used have been free. I think you just used the free version as well. Um, if I go back to the example of the French faculty member, she loved it so much, she went to her dean, and um, I think she got a one licensed faculty version that was under $100. Um, there also are site licenses as well. Um, so, the one they want to sell. Oh, yeah, I don't have the well, they, they, they have the free version, and they have the low for one licensed version. I actually recommended my group of faculty to only get one license and everybody sharing. Yeah. Just respect each other's productions. Yeah. And that worked for them while they experiment and they decide. And they have other versions which are, you know, a little bit price or if you want it for the whole university or a group of people. But but they but they're free, which was the you know, and the and the one that you pay, but actually it allows you to go backwards uh, you know, to go in in, in, the, in the back area of the software and see what were your contributions and stuff like that and assessment. And for assessment and, and you know for, for for accountability in terms of who participated, how many times and so on. Is it possible to edit your message within three years? I haven't tried to go back and edit mine through that some sort you, of you can do some some editing, some basic editing like calling uh, I don't think that. Absolutely. Yeah, you 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 can you can cut the ends, and you can you know I only did video, but you can add uh, you know it's kind of a mashup too, so you can actually add 
documents and other stuff if you want them to evaluate, you know, review more stuff, not just your video. So, for example, in the one that is the, the first one, there was a small introduction to the activity and then the actual document that were also posted in the LMS, but the actual documents were there for the students to know, ah, it's this document and this document and this document that I need to review and read before I give my feedback. Another question, just an observation. Coming from a background in marketing, I know at some point in the very near future, all of your news outlets are going to subscribe to a model similar to VoiceThread, where they're allowing users to not simply type their response to something interact with yeah. it. Well, it's funny you say that because this might be another beat up topic. Another area of interest of ours is uh, open education resources and, and OER aggregators um, going beyond textbooks. And everything has become commentable. I mean, that's cliche to say that, but in our social connected world, everything is commentable. In VoiceThread, I don't know if we saw the dial here with the phone, with the video, with the audio, with the file, but everything is commentable and interactive. So I wouldn't disagree with you. Uh, from a learning perspective or even a training perspective, from your background, uh, you know, the ability for one to see that real artifact of that paper or that high quality example um, and then go and comment and ask questions and start a conversation or a learning um, prompt of anything, that is, that is powerful. I think the challenge of the LMS is that the LMS has been too boxed in, too scripted, and too, and too uh, designed for versus our organic learning experience that we're having now, the social constructivist back and forth. Can you, can you embed voice into an LMS, yes. or is it some yes. environment? Yes, 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 and yes. Yes, um, and yes. In my version, I actually just linked out to it, but you can use it as an LTI tool in your LMS. Single sign-on? Yes, yes. With your LMS? Yes. And, and the, the interesting, I mean, the reason why I thought that was good is because that's, in the, the universities I work with, in the effort, to uh, reduce variability, they have decided everybody needs to have this part in their course every week. This and this and this and this. That has become so boxy, and they call it that's our educational model. That's not the educational model. That's not an educational model. That's a design, a, a configuration or something. And the professors have been so boxed in that when they came into my training, they were just dying to get away from it. And by having this, suddenly they have this. Because of all the things that they hate, they, you know, they were plagiarizing the, the readings in their courses. So they just PDF, you know, just like it happens in the Facebook. Okay, guys, we need to not do this, we need to do it this and this way, perfect. And okay, can we do something more interesting? Maybe an e reading or something that is more interesting. But once, but of all the things that I was showing them that to make uh, their course more of the century, the thing that they actually had a breath of, of air was this. Because they hated social media. They absolutely despise, they find it boring. For many reasons, some methodological, some because they absolutely put very boring questions that you can actually find in the book, mm -hmm. or you can answer with a yes or no, then that's not a discussion if you can answer it with a yes or no. So there were methodological challenges to their conception of a discussion board. But by doing this, and by me giving them the rule that it had to be a challenging and disruptive question that questions and that make people argue and dialogue. Well, I, mean, I know, it's passion. Or they're kicking one of the two. It, it could, it, you know, they, it allowed them to breathe air and say, oh my God, we have another opportunity to do this better and different. And 
stuff. And what I think is the reason I wanted Caroline to hear, uh, aside from the fact that I love working with her and she's amazing, is that is that yes, these were very different audiences. Um, these are very different groups, different cultures. Um, I think they control it from, from uh, master control. Uh, master control. Uh, these are very different examples, and they happen at different times. You know, is it that epiphany that you're talking about, that thirst, that hunger for a more uh, meaningful way of interacting and connecting um, for a learning purpose? But could be beyond that. That was the same thing. That was the same thing. And thank you. Right. And like, maybe I can eat that to be about it for like a month before I do it. She does. She does. I'm just finding. Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. Thank you.